Hi, this is a follow-up video to another video that I published recently about a pair of really early 1930s Newtone two-note chimes. And if you watched the first video, you'll recognize this. This is one of the two chimes in that video. One of the things I talked about in that video was that on the base of this unit, up here in the top, printed is, it says, patented United States patent number and there's a number on it and I thought that was kind of curious so I spent a little bit of time the other morning looking around on the internet to see if I could find the patent information that went along with this number and I have to say that the US government they have a really good patent and trademark website they have patents and all of the information for those patents that go all the way back to the 1790s I think it is it's actually a very good website and actually works really well and it's really easy to use put in the patent number that's on the chime base and it wasn't a new tone chime it was some sort of agricultural piece of equipment or something I thought that was kind of interesting however the date of the patent was around 1938 which is what I when I assume this chime was probably manufactured so I thought I was kind of close so I started poking around a little bit more to see what else I could find and I actually came up with a patent not for this exact chime but a chime very close to it. What we have here are printed out copies of the original patent documents. This is for patent number 2,133,911 which is very close to the number that's on the printed on the chime base and it may be that the the number on the base was printed incorrectly or it's a little bit worn so maybe it's a little hard to read. I don't think it's exactly the same chime but it's very close because down here United States Patent Office musical chime the patent was actually issued to Lowell M. Alexander and we'll talk about Lowell in a little bit. Cincinnati, Ohio a signer to Newtone Chimes Incorporated New York, New York a corporation of New York. I'm not sure why they're a corporation of New York since they were in Cincinnati, but that was probably some legal thing that you did in those days and probably still goes on today. Application was October 7th, 1937, and the patent was granted in, on October 18th, 1938. So it took a little more than a year to actually have the patent issued and approved. And over here it's stamped reissued February 20th, 1940. I'm not sure why that is. I haven't looked into that. If you read through this, it gives you a highly detailed description of all aspects of the chime itself. It goes on and on and on, and it explains in great detail and describes things to a large extent the way I read it. It covers the same information many, many, many times in all of this, sort of every which way from Sunday. And I think what they're trying to do is cover all of the possible ways that you could possibly describe what this chime is, how it's constructed, and what it does so that no one else can find a loophole in trying to copy it. And it's actually very interesting to read and I'm not going to bore you with all of it, but I have highlighted some of the more important parts in relationship to the chime, at least what I'm interested in and what you might be interested in also. And as you can see, it's nearly three full pages. And then here, the last page, this is a certificate of correction and it was dated October 18th, 1938 which is the same day the patent was issued. It certifies that there are errors appear in the printed specifications and it explains what those errors were. Mostly it's terminology and things like that. No major changes. So it says Lowell M. Alexander here at the top, but down here it was it's the acting commissioner of patents, Henry Van Arsdale. How about that? Van Arsdale is a pretty good name. It sounds like somebody that would be a banker or a government official, I think. Let's get the chime back on the bench and I'm going to cover some of the descriptions that I've highlighted here and point out how it relates to the chime itself. The other thing when you get when you print this out is you actually get the original engineer drawing that goes along with this. And while this is not precisely the chime that we have on, we're gonna have on the workbench here. I'm pretty sure it relates to it very closely and I'm gonna show you how I think I know that at the end of the video. Here's one thing to keep a watch out for right now. I'll point out in the drawing, you have the chime base, you have the solenoids, you have the resonating tubes and you have the tone bars drawn in and you have this circular line that goes around it here. 
and the circular line, according to the description, is where the cover fits over the chime to hide the mechanism. So remember about the round cover because you're going to want to know about that and remember it in just a little bit. So here we have a close-up of the chime base, and I'm going to read just the things I highlighted in the description here and point out how it applies to what you're looking at here. Number 10 on the list, figure one is a base view of the musical chime embodying two resonators having different pitches and also embodying electromagnetic means for vibrating one or both of the bars selectively. And these would be the resonators, and here are your electromagnetic devices, and it's a door chime, that's what it is. It says, a base plate, number 10, provides a mounting bracket and the bars are attached there too. It uses a lot of words like there too, it's kind of interesting. Each by means of a pair of angular brackets. So here are our angular brackets, and it's what the tone bars are attached to. By virtue of this arrangement, the bars essentially are balanced on the middle of nodal supports. By virtue of this arrangement, the bars essentially are balanced on the middle nodal supports, that's these, and are free to vibrate and develop complete anti-nodes on either side of the central nodal support. How's that for being complicated? A pair of sponge rubber washers is provided on the screws, one on each side of the bar. These serve to prevent the bars from coming into contact with the head of the screw or with the bracket. Thus, the bars are securely held in place, but are also loosely hung and cushioned so that the impact of the strikers in contacting the reeds does not pr produce a jangle, which would result with the bars in contact with the metal parts. So they have grommets, or in those days, it would have been sponge rubber washers. I don't think we have sponge rubber washers anymore, but that's what they had in the 30s. The percussion of the striker, unit number nine, consists of a pair of solenoid coils, that's these. Each coil includes a brass sleeve, which is what's through the center of the coil. Each of the sleeves houses a striker consisting of an iron solenoid plunger sustained therein with a light compression spring. So here's our light compression spring and here's our iron plunger. The extended portion of the plungers is a non-metallic material such as wood so that as not to be affected by the magnetic flux of the coils. So we hypothesized in the other video that the striker tips, which are wood, may have been replaced, but now we know that they used wood instead of plastic. I would assume because perhaps plastic wasn't developed far enough along in those days. In the 30s, I think for the most part, they had Bakelite and they had Catalan, which are two early phenolic resins, and perhaps you couldn't make it or they weren't the right kind of material to be struck all the time. I know both of those are fairly brittle, so perhaps in a small cylinder or rod like the tips, they would break off, so wood was the choice. When the upper solenoid coil is energized, the plunger is drawn sharply to the right, the inertia carrying it beyond the central point in the coil so as to strike the right-hand bar, this one. After striking the bar, the plunger centralizes in the coil so as to keep the cushioned striker out of the end of the contact with the bar. When the coil is de-energized, the plunger is retracted by the spring against the stop screw. The lower coil operates in the same manner in striking the right-hand tone bar, but when the coil is de-energized, the spring forces the plunger sharply to the left to strike the left-hand bar as so to produce a two-tone or chord effect. And that's exactly how a door chime works. That's just a really long explanation of how to do it. I think from now on, when I explain to someone on the phone about how a door chime works, that's the description I'm going to use because it sounds really smart. And I'll explain to you why it sounds really smart. It sounds really smart, I think, because a lawyer wrote this. And this patent application was actually written by attorneys from the firm of Wood and Wood. By this arrangement, the device produces two entirely different signals, each coil being in connection with a separate signal button for independent operation. For example, if the buttons are located at two doors in different parts of the house, the signals being readily distinguishable will indicate which door is to be attended. So it's a two-door chime, front door, rear door, and you know where the person is. A cover or 
housing is provided on the device for concealing from view the base plate and the mechanism mounted thereon. Within the cover, the resonators, the bars, and the electromagnetic means for striking the reeds are mounted externally of the housing. However, the bars are extended so they may be struck manually by a conventional resilient chime hammer. And we talked about that a little bit, how when you place the cover over the mechanism, the tone bars extend down below the covers. And I sort of hypothesized that they did that for a different sound quality or maybe just for decoration. However, the idea behind it apparently was that you could strike it with a conventional resilient chime hammer because everybody's got one of those laying around their house. I think I have three or four of those laying around just in case I need to strike a chime. I don't know, maybe people did that. I know that Newtone did make a handheld dinner chime where you would chime people into supper, I guess. I actually have talked to a customer who lives in the South. She said that when she was growing up in the 50s, I guess it was a big house and her parents were probably somewhat wealthy and they had servants. They actually did get chimed into dinner. And I think this is an outgrowth of the English tradition where in the Victorian times, they would have a big gong in the house. If you were wealthy, you would have a gong and the servants would ring the gong and call you to dinner. I think that's where that kind of comes from. By virtue of this arrangement, the chimes may be utilized for electrical operation from a remote point or manually to announce mealtime and for similar purposes. All of these documents I'm going to put on our website as PDFs and you can download them if you're interested and read the whole thing. It's quite interesting to see how wordy it all gets and they truly do go over the same points over and over and over again it seems like but I guess that's what you have to do. And then the patent is signed by Lowell M. Alexander. So who is Lowell M. Alexander. Those of us who are Newtone people and have done this for a really long time, we know that Mr. Corbett, who founded Newtone, I don't know if they call them founders in those days, he started the company, I know that. It, it was always well known that he worked with a college professor at the University of Cincinnati to help develop and design the original door chimes. Turns out that Lowell M. Alexander was an associate professor in physics at the University of Cincinnati. So this must be the mystery professor that Mr. Corbett collaborated with to develop the door chimes. These are basically his design. I think it's pretty cool that a university professor, and especially in physics, because you wouldn't think there would be a lot of physics involved in a door chime, but apparently there is. I'm sure they had mechanical engineers in those days, but maybe Mr. Alexander and Mr. Corbett were friends and they collaborated on it. And I hope that good old Lowell here, he got something out of the deal. I'm sure he got paid or he got something out of it. At least maybe he got a free door chime. I don't really know, but I find it kind of interesting. I found something else that goes along with this that you might find interesting. And remember, don't forget about the round cover. When I found this patent and I looked at the drawing carefully and I noticed the round cover, it reminded me that I've seen this chime before. Now, I've never seen it in real life, but I have seen it before. And where did I see it? I saw it here. This is a page out of a late 30s construction supply or electrical supply catalog. And here we have the chime that's in the drawing. It has the round circular cover. It has the two resonator tubes, which are close together as they are in the drawing, which is distinctly different than the actual chime that we had on the bench here where the resonators are further apart. This is the chime that's in the patent drawing. If we look at the description down here, it says it's a Style B Junior model. It costs seven dollars and twenty cents, and this would be in 37, 38, or 39. And the description says sounds double tone for front door plus single tone for rear door. Choice of white or ivory. Beautiful and durable baked enamel finish. Has chromium trim. Fits perfectly into kitchen or hallways. Wall space required. Height 12 and 3 quarter inches. Width five and five eighths inches attached to a regular bell wiring operates on eight to ten volt transformer or dry cell batteries. I never thought you would run a chime off dry cell batteries but I suppose you probably could. So this is the chime that's in Lowell Alexander's patent application. It's the same exact chime. Now I've never seen one of these before and I would very much like to have one of these in my office. I assume they're probably pretty rare and you have this 
circular cover which has this art deco theme going on with it it's a very nice art deco style as we talked about in the video a little bit right next to it on the same page we have dinner chime that new tone made and it's three resonator tubes with three tone bars and here's our resilient chime hammer and of course everybody would have one of these in their house and you could use it if you didn't buy this you could use it to strike the tone bars on the style b junior model i found that very interesting now how does this to me prove that the chime that we had on the had on the workbench how is it from this same time well i'm going to show you that now on the top part of the same page look what we have we have a photograph or a drawing, I'm not sure which it is, of the chime that we had on the workbench. And the description is, it's a B Deluxe model. It costs $9.04. And the description is, sounds double chime for front door plus single note for rear door. Choice of brown or ivory cover with tarnish proof brass tubes. Wall space required 12 and 5 8 by 8 inches. Operates on regular 8 to 10 volt doorbell transformer already in a home or dry cell batteries. Pretty much the same specifications. And as you can see here, the resonator tubes are spaced further apart than the Style B Junior. And the tone, here we have our tone bars on the outside of the resonators where you could strike them with your resilient chime hammer. So this is the same chime. This is probably the brown colored one and you have the torch of life motif here in the middle these chimes were made at the same time they're just variations on a basic design an interesting advertising part on the page easily attached to present doorbell wiring without any changes in wiring the clanging doorbell is a nerve-wracking as the shrill screech of a parrot but newtone door chime is as welcome as the melody of birds in the spring all new tone door chimes operate from regular doorbell push button on alternating current 110 volts or dry cell battery positively must not be attached to direct current here we have pretty conclusive proof that the chime that i have that is featured in this video in the previous video is from the late 1930s probably 37 38 or 39 and i thought you might find this interesting a little bit of history that fills in some of the gaps of the earliest days of new tone door chimes this page is already on our website and i will put all of the patent documents and drawings as pdfs that you can download in case you want to read them i hope you found this interesting and perhaps helpful if you did please give it a big thumbs up on youtube because that always helps. There'll be a banner right here that shows you how to subscribe. Go to our YouTube homepage, click on the bell or on the wheel, put in your email address, and every time we post a new video, you'll get a notification and you can watch it. That's all for today. See you on the next video.